a little bit. The rain is lightning, so it's not just that you've stepped under this tent to come out from out of the rain. Come in from out of the rain. I know why you're all here. Um, in addition to wrapping up what has been a fantastic event today, uh, to, for, for which we owe a lot of thanks to a lot of people, all the food vendors that are here um, who provide us with delicious meals, all the experts who've given us the workshops so we can take new information and inspiration back to our gardens as we uh, hunker down for a wonderful, hopefully very long stretch of a great Canadian summer gardening. Um, so the finale to this great event, of course, is to hear um, from the great Dr. David Suzuki. Um, I have an official uh, bio that I will read you. David Suzuki is um, the co-founder. I was told you one of I was told you one of all the dirt. You know who this man is. He is the founder of the David Suzuki Foundation, of course. He's, you know, renowned. Um, for his work as a scientist, as a broadcaster, and of course as a passionate environmentalist. He's written so, so many books, many of which are um, for sale on the book uh, table down there. Um, and he's of course the host of the CBC program, The Nature of Things, and has been for so many years. Um, on a personal note, in addition to all these things that are printed on uh, David Suzuki's bio, I think I am not alone, and I know I'm not alone, when I say that um, you know, I assume that everybody here is in some way, in their own way, a champion of the earth. And David Suzuki is nothing short of uh, a pollinator himself, uh, a fabulous um, and profound inspiration to all of us. He's, uh, he's the perfect symbol of pollination, really, as he travels around on the wind, um, sharing information and inspiration and enthusiasm and commitment and determination to keep this planet to make it a little healthier and to keep it as healthy as it possibly can be. Um, we're so happy to have you here. David Suzuki. I'm delighted to be introduced by Jill because I really see Jill as, as that, that coming group that's going to take over from all the old farts like me. <laughs> so that you can carry on the struggle. And uh, uh, Jill, you're a good one. It's great. And thank you all for coming out today on this uh, day. I was just telling the people I just arrived from Fredericton, which is underwater, as if you've seen the news. And it uh, looks to me like Toronto may be soon as well. But you've come out today, and uh, uh, thank you very much. I've been trying to figure out what the heck what I have to say. I mean, we all know that pollination is important and all that. And I was trying to think in a, in a broader sense of why pollinators and gardening matters. You know, when I first heard the report that honeybees were mysteriously disappearing, I felt a real wave of fear running through my body. In the same way that I felt a wave of fear when I first heard that frogs were mysteriously disappearing all over the planet. And it was always shocking to me that there didn't seem to be this great uh, wave of concern and, and demand that something be done. And I think in part it's because we've kind of lost that connection with, with nature. Pollinators, something, if you think about it, so obviously important for our survival. And yet most of us live in cities. We live in a human-created environment, surrounded primarily by other human beings. And I think we've really uh, lost that contact with the natural world that would inform us the loss of honeybees or frogs is a truly frightening thing. E.O. Wilson, probably one of the great naturalists in the world at Harvard, is an ant expert. And he tells the story that if all human beings disappeared overnight, we went extinct, probably fewer than a dozen other species, these would be parasites that live in our armpits or our guts, would go extinct along with us. And the rest of nature would rebound. The planet would become green and the world would be filled with animals again in a very short period of time. But if all of the ants in the world disappeared, all of the terrestrial ecosystems on the planet would collapse. And it kind of puts things into perspective. We think we're so important, but it's the little things 
that are very, very crucial, and that's the role that, that pollinators play. I, I wanted to just give you a couple of ideas to think about. You know, for 99% of human existence, we were nomads. We were hunter-gatherers who followed where the food was, where we could uh, find shelter and, and live. We were deeply embedded in the natural world. And the way, for 99% of human existence, the way we saw ourselves was a part of a great web of living things. We didn't see ourselves as superior to the rest of nature or outside of it. We were deeply embedded in the natural world. It's what we call a biocentric position. We saw life in all of its extravagance around the world and we were a part of that web of living things and we saw the world as interdependent and interconnected. And in a world in which everything is interconnected, everything we do has repercussions. And therefore, everything we do has responsibilities. And I believe that's the way that people live for most of human existence. Indeed, if you go to First Nations communities in many parts of the world, you still find that sense. And when you live in an interconnected world, in an interdependent world, you feel that sense of, of responsibility. But something fundamentally different has happened in the last 150 years. And I believe one of the driving forces of the change was our move from being farmers to being big city dwellers. In 1900, there were a billion and a half people in the world. There were only 16 cities with more than a million people. London was the largest city in the world with six and a half million people. Tokyo was the seventh largest city with one and a half million people. Over 90% of people in the world, including in Canada and the United States, lived in small rural village communities. We were farmers. And when you're a farmer or a gardener, you know about the seasons. You know that, that uh, uh, snow is related to the amount of moisture in the summer. You know what insect pests are and good insects are and, and weed species of plants and good species of plants. We understand those things because they're important to what we do as farmers. In only a hundred years, by the year 2000, the population of the planet had quadrupled to six billion people by the year 2000. But now there were over 400 cities with more than a million people. The 10 largest cities in the year 2000 all had more than 11 million people. Tokyo was the largest with 26 million people. Can you imagine? From a million and a half in the year 1900 to 26 million by the year 2000. If you've ever been to Tokyo, you know human beings should live that way. We weren't made to live that way. But we see now to be flooding into cities and in countries like Canada and Japan and the United States and Europe, over 80% of us live in big cities. We've gone from being a farming species to a big city dweller. And in a big city, it becomes easy to think, we're not like other creatures. We're so smart, we create our own habitat. We don't need nature. And uh, <laughs> I think that begins <clears throat> this process of estrangement, isolation, separation from the natural world. You all know that a recent report came out that this generation of children spends the least amount of time outside of any generation in human history. And it's, we, we feel that we're, we, we're somehow uh, separated from that world. And I'd just like to end with a little story that I made up. I want you to imagine the scientists have made a great breakthrough that they have invented time travel. And imagine that this, this whole area here under the roof is a giant time machine. And I'm going to dial back and take us back four billion years before there was any life on the planet, okay? Well, you'd have to imagine that this is enclosed, it's a capsule. <laughs> so we dial back, go back to four billion years, and of course when you get there, we all want to run out and see what was the world like before there was any life on Earth. 